Hey guys, welcome to Backstage with Millionaires. I'm Caleb, your host, and today we're gonna be talking about Yes Bank. Now, as many of you know, the moratorium that the Reserve Bank of India placed on Yes Bank on the 5th of March, 2020, has now been lifted after less than two weeks, today on the 18th of March, 2020. This is happening more than two weeks ahead of schedule, as the RBI had initially said that they would lift the moratorium on the 3rd of April. However, it took them far less time than they had initially anticipated to come up with a rescue plan for Yes Bank. And Yes Bank account holders are very grateful for this fact, myself among them. This rescue plan came in the form of several different banks purchasing large stakes in Yes Bank. These banks include the State Bank of India, which has invested more than 6,000 crores and will hold a 48.21% stake in the bank, HDFC Bank, which will hold a 7.97% stake, Corporation Bank, ICICI Bank, Axis Bank, Kotak Mahindra Bank, Federal Bank, Pandan Bank, and IDFC First Bank. This reconstructed Yes Bank will be led by Prashant Kumar, who's the former CFO of SBI, and he'll be taking charge as MD and CEO. However, things aren't looking as good for one of Yes Bank's co-founders, Rana Kapoor, who was arrested on the 8th of March for alleged fraud and put under the custody of the Enforcement Dictoriate. The Enforcement Dictoriate revealed that during Kapoor's time as CEO, the bank gave out 30,000 crores worth in loans, 20,000 crores of which were bad loans. The Enforcement Directorate also revealed that Rana Kapoor received 4,300 crores, that's 43 billion rupees, from these loan deals, which turned out to be bad for the bank, but pretty good for him, at least in the short term. And by the way, a bad loan is a loan that's given to an entity who is unlikely to be able to pay back the loan in full. So needless to say, a lot has happened over the course of the last two weeks, but right now, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Yes Bank's story and how this all came to be. Yes Bank is India's fourth largest private sector bank with over 20,000 employees and 1,120 branches across the country. The bank holds deposits worth more than 2 lakh crore rupees, that's 2 trillion rupees, and its story started at the tail end of the 20th century in 1999. Rana Kapoor, Harkirat Singh, and Ashok Kapoor first came together to help Rabobank, a Dutch banking and financial company, to set up their operations in India. The trio had established Rabo India Finance as an NBFC, but with the effects of the Asian currency crisis still looming over the financial industry, the business did not succeed in India. However, the learnings from this experience enabled the three co-founders to set up Yes Bank in 2003, but the bank got off to a rocky start when one of the three co-founders, Harkirat Singh, was ousted from the bank in the early days after the bank had got its banking license from the Reserve Bank of India and before it started operations in 2004. And this kind of makes a little bit of sense when you realize that the other two co-founders were actually brothers-in-law. Rana had married Ashok's wife's sister Bindu, whereas Harkirat Singh was just a friend. After Yes Bank went public in 2005, it saw steady growth up until 2008, with Ashok taking the role of chairman and Rana taking the role of MD and CEO. Then, in 2008, 10 terrorists carried out 12 coordinated shooting and bombing attacks in Mumbai, killing at least 174 people. Ashok was one of them. Rana was now alone, running Yes Bank without the support or guidance of his two co-founders. He was a dynamic and unconventional leader, and his interesting lending strategies enabled Yes Bank to emerge as one of the fastest growing banks in the country. In fact, the bank's growth was so monumental that Rana Kapoor became the second billionaire to come out of India's banking industry after Uday Kotak of Kotak Mahindra Bank. So what were these interesting lending strategies that enabled Yes Bank to do so well in its early years? Well, it's actually quite simple. Yes Bank gave loans to companies and corporations that other banks had refused to give loans to. In other words, Yes Bank said yes when other banks said no. While this was a greater risk to the bank, they tried to ensure that their NPAs, that's non-performing assets, stayed low by arranging loans from other lenders for their clients who were struggling to pay back their Yes Bank loans. So in other words, borrowing from Peter to pay back Paul. And it appears that this strategy did work for Yes Bank for a time. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have adopted it in the first place. However, this was not a good long-term strategy as we're seeing today. 
In 2015, global financial services company UBS revealed that a large portion of Yes Bank's loans were being given to potentially high-risk debtors, which made the bank vulnerable to a large corporate default. At the time of this report, Yes Bank's loan book was already massive at 75,000 crores or 750 billion rupees. However, Yes Bank chose to ignore UBS's report and continued operating with the same lending practices that they always had. By 2018, the bank's loan book had grown to 2 lakh crores, that's 2 trillion rupees. Over the years, some of the struggling companies that have received loans from Yes Bank that went bad include Anil Ambani's Reliance Group, BJP MP Subhash Chandra's Essel Group, Dewan Housing Finance Corporation Limited, Infrastructure Leasing and Financial Services, Carecar Group's Cox and Kings, CG Power, and Jet Airways. Among these companies, infrastructure leasing and financial services would go on to collapse in September of 2018, and Jet Airways would cease operations in April of 2019, leaving Yes Bank high and dry. So there's a question that needs to be asked now. What was the Reserve Bank of India doing while all of this was taking place? Why didn't they hit the brakes on this risky lending sooner? Well, the RBI has actually been keeping a pretty close eye on the situation for the last couple of years. Yes Bank's gross MPAs amounted to 748 crores, that's 74.8 billion rupees for the financial year 2016, or at least that's what Yes Bank told everybody. The RBI conducted an audit and found that their NPAs actually amounted to 49,256 crores. And considering that Yes Bank was one of the fastest growing banks at the time and their share prices were doing very well, it makes sense that Yes Bank wouldn't have wanted the public to realize that they weren't doing as well as everybody thought they were. So they lied. Unsurprisingly, the RBI was not happy about this and imposed a fine on Yes Bank of 6 crores, that's 60 million rupees, for non-compliance of norms. Then, in 2018, Yes Bank did it again when they reported that their MPAs amounted to 2,020 crores, that's 20.2 billion rupees, for the financial year 2017. But an RBI audit revealed that this number accounted for less than a fourth of the MPAs, and that the actual number was 8,370 crores, or 83.7 billion rupees. Either the slap on the wrist that the RBI gave to Yes Bank back in 2017 wasn't a hard enough slap, or Yes Bank wasn't in control of the situation and couldn't right its wrongs quickly enough. Either way, things were about to go from bad to worse. Yes Bank's collapse officially began in August of 2018. Seeing that Yes Bank wasn't going to change on their own, the RBI ordered Yes Bank to find themselves a new CEO. Rana Kapoor was asked to quit by January of 2019, and this news shook investors. Yes Bank's share prices peaked in August of 2018 at 400 rupees per share, but they've been steadily declining ever since. A day after the moratorium was announced, Yes Bank's share prices hit rock bottom at less than 20 rupees a share. However, these share prices have recovered a little bit since the moratorium was lifted. And it looks like a lot of the panic that the Yes Bank crisis created initially has dissipated. Then, as I mentioned earlier, in September of 2018, infrastructure leasing and financial services collapsed. And then in April of 2019, Jet Airways ceased operations. Combined, these two companies had been loaned more than 3,500 crores, that's 35 billion rupees, from Yes Bank. After the removal of Rana Kapoor, Ravneet Gill was appointed as the CEO of Yes Bank, but he failed to secure fresh capital, which would have served as a crutch for the collapsing bank. In April of 2019, Yes Bank announced its first ever quarterly loss of 1,506 crores, or 15.06 billion rupees, after reporting a profit of 1,180 crores, or 11.8 billion rupees, during the same period in the previous year. To make matters worse, agencies like CARE, Moody's, ICRA, and Macquarie gave Yes Bank poor ratings, which made it even less likely that they would be able to secure funds. Then, Yes Bank's own creator, Rana Kapoor, sounded the death knell for the bank when he sold his entire stake in November of 2019, just one year after he had compared his shares to diamonds. The RBI continued to impose fines on Yes Bank for violating money transfer norms and prepaid payment instruments norms. And then finally, the lowest that Yes Bank has ever come, the Reserve Bank of India's moratorium, which thankfully was not the end of the Yes Bank story, but rather just the end of a chapter. And here's hoping that the future of Yes Bank is brighter and more honest than its past. Thanks to the combined efforts of the Reserve Bank of India, the State Bank of India, and all of the other banks that I mentioned earlier in this video, Yes Bank is finally back on their feet, albeit with a bit of a limp. 
But even though the moratorium has been lifted, there are still a lot of questions that need to be answered. For example, could this have been avoided? Also, who is to blame for this situation? I know it's very easy to put all the blame on Rana Kapoor. He was the figurehead of the company. He was charismatic. He was unconventional. But he also had an entire board that was running the bank with him. These are big questions that need to be answered. And I hope that with time, they do get answered. There are millions of people who combined have deposited over 2 lakh crores, that's 2 trillion rupees, into Yes Bank. Can these people trust their bank, especially after having it fail them once already? And this Yes Bank crisis hasn't just affected Yes Bank account holders, it's also affected people who have purchased Yes Bank shares or people who have invested in mutual funds. Because up until August of 2018, when Yes Bank stock prices started to go down, Yes Bank was an investor favorite. In fact, as of the 31st of January of 2020, 103 mutual fund schemes had Yes Bank in their portfolio. And these schemes had a collective exposure of 3,400 crores towards Yes Bank. Unfortunately, it looks like investors probably aren't going to stop with Yes Bank. It's likely that investors are going to take a step back, look at the banking ecosystem as a whole, reevaluate, and then invest a little bit more cautiously moving forward, which of course is going to slow down the economy here in India even more than it already has. What's more, fintech startups were riding a wave of success, cashing in on what they thought was a robust banking system. However, companies like PhonePay realized that the system wasn't as robust as it seemed. And so it's likely that the fintech space, along with investments into the banking industry, are going to slow down a little bit moving forward here in India. Now, we can't change the past. What's done is done. However, I do think that Yes Bank has taught everybody, especially the RBI and fellow banks, a very important lesson. You can't build a bank on high-risk loans. The RBI should have put a stop to this a long time ago, but they didn't. And now they're backpedaling, trying to salvage a situation that they could have prevented. However, I think that the question that everybody should be asking is when. When should the RBI have stepped in? And that's a really hard question to answer. But if India is to become the $5 trillion economy that the Modi government envisioned, then that answer will need to be made clear for banks moving forward. And speaking of banks, I really think it's worth examining the banks that are now supporting Yes Bank. After all, Yes Bank used to be a leading bank, like many of these banks now are. Are these banks stable? Are their NPAs low? Because according to the latest International Monetary Fund data, with 10.7% of gross NPAs, India is only behind Russia in terms of bad loans compared to other large economies. And if you compare that to a country like Canada with 0.4% NPAs, it just doesn't look good for India, no matter what bank you're talking about. So while I am happy that this moratorium is over and Yes Bank account holders can finally breathe a little bit more easily knowing that they have access to their money, I do think that this Yes Bank crisis is more of a symptom rather than the disease itself. And if Indian banks don't start cleaning up their act, we might start to see more effects of this disease. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Make sure that you wash your hands, try to keep your distance from other people as much as possible, and don't put all of your money in one bank. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Backstage with Millionaires, guys. Would love it if you could leave a comment down below and let me know what your thoughts were on the crisis and also the way forward for Yes Bank, um, whether you were an account holder, an investor, a stakeholder, or just someone who was watching from the sidelines. Uh, would love to know your thoughts down below. And would also love it if you could share this video with anybody that you think would enjoy it. All right, see you in the next one, guys.